Good evening. Right now, Metro police are desperately searching for the person or people responsible for killing a man and a woman. I got a down the street. Breaking news now. A triple shooting leaves two dead. Never expect for somebody to tell you your loved one was, was murdered. This Labor Day will mark 42 years that have haunted the St. Cloud family. 30 years. 30 years this family has waited for answers. A couple months go by, three, four, five, six, and you, you really start to struggle with the idea that the case might not get solved and uh, that somebody might get away with murder. It's very unfortunate that we have any cold cases at all, and certainly unfortunate that we have as many as we do. And that's why the Ryan's work and the work of Project Cold Case is so important. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us again this week. I'm Ryan Backman, the founder and executive director of Project Cold Case, and this is Frida, Frida. Washington Perez. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Your, your victim advocate. Yeah, uh, this is the the face with the voice you hear on the phone, <laughs> the uh, the face on the other side of the keyboard, uh, typing that email to you, uh, typically. Uh, this week we wanted to, Frida gets a lot of questions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we're doing a lot more outreach right now. We're talking to a lot more survivors. We're getting a lot more case submissions in as, as our, um, our brand grows mm -hmm. as people become more and more aware of Project Cold Case. They're sharing our information, which is, which is wonderful. That's what we want. Uh, but that leads to more cases coming in. Exactly. And um, sometimes there can be some misconceptions out there about what we do and don't do. And Frida always ends up having to answer those mm -hmm. questions. So we thought this week would be a good opportunity to kind of go through a list of, and I'm, I'm not going to say all of the services no, we provide list because all <laughs> there's always something that will pop up that, that we do. But um, kind of what to expect if you submit your loved one to our agency, our organization, what we're going to do, what we're going to try to do, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even some kind of longer term goals that we hope to be able to do in the future. Uh, uh, there's a lot of brainstorming that goes on in this office. Yeah. I love it. Um, we're always thinking, we're always trying to figure out new ways to raise awareness for cases, uh, new ways to, to reach people. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the hope is, of course, to resolve the case. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is not this a static this is a very fluid list that will evolve and grow <laughs> uh, as the opportunities arrive and that's going to be kind of a key theme uh, we talk about when opportunities arrive um, that's why we need as much information as possible that's why we need contact information up-to-date contact information as much detail about a case as possible because whenever an opportunity arises um, we dive in and we grab every case that fits that criteria, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and then we start sorting through and trying to figure out um, which cases um, best fit uh, that, that opportunity. So, um, but we're going to start from the beginning with a case submission. So yes. projectcoldcase.org is our website. Under the contact tab, there is a submit a case mm -hmm. uh, button that... Uh, we ask survivors, family members to, um, to complete that. Uh, law enforcement can do it as well, and they do on occasion. Um, but submit that information. That is all uh, kind of the, not all of it is required, but that's, that's the basis. All of that information, really, the more of that you can complete and give to us and the more detail you can provide to us, the better, you know, we can do our job mm -hmm. and, and serve you. So, um, that includes a picture. I know sometimes, you know, people find our, our website while they're just, you know, surfing the web and they may not have uh, access mm -hmm. to a photo of their loved one right then. That's okay. You don't have to complete another submission form. You can just email in that photo either to Frida um, or to the info at projectcoldcase.org uh, email address or Frida's email is FridaWP at projectcoldcase.org. Uh, as long as you follow up that submission with a picture, you don't have to go all the way through uh, and resubmitting it. But it's important that we get a picture. Um, yeah, I, I do see that a lot where there is a double submission, which, of course, you don't have to do. But if you do send me the picture directly, please make sure you put your loved one's name on there. It just kind of keeps, you know, the process fluid and, and moving forward. Um, sometimes I'll just get pictures and I'm like, 
I don't know, you know, what yeah. loved one this is. Yeah, so. remember that, you know, in any given day, we may have multiple submissions coming exactly. in. So, um, and, and you may not follow up immediately after that, your submission. It may be hours mm -hmm. or even days later mm -hmm. that your picture comes through. So, um, you know, make sure that, uh, that you put the victim's name on there. Um, there's a, an area for information about the crime, about mm -hmm. the murder, and, and we ask specifically for you to be as detailed as possible. Um, I can't stress that enough. You know, you may not have a lot of information. You may not have all the information. We're sure you don't have all the information mm -hmm. if you're submitting the case. But when it comes across and it just says, killed in drive-by, like yeah. that that's that's hard for us to you know we're we're wanting to go beyond just uh putting your loved one's picture on a website and so we need you know uh more detail and as much detail as possible I, you know you can't you really can't give too much detail mm -hmm. the, these submissions are private it doesn't mean that we're going to use everything that you say publicly um but it does help us to to paint a picture and understand what's going on and then of course as we'll talk about later, when somebody reaches out to us and says, hey, I'm looking for cases that were X, Y, and Z, um, it's easier for mm -hmm. us to find out if your loved one matches that criteria, mm -hmm. if we have all that information. So um, when you do that, when you submit your loved one's case through that link on our website, um, what that immediately will do, or close to immediately, will uh, Put your loved one on our website on our faces of unsolved homicide page um, we have over 600 pictures on there 630 some pictures on that faces of unsolved homicide page now um, you know but you can go to that page you can share that page um, that's kind of the the start when we started this organization we wanted families to have a place online where they could go put their loved one where they would always be and they would know somebody else cared and that their loved one wasn't forgotten. That's what that Faces of Unsolved Homicide page is. It, it also provides um, some context to maybe a false narrative that murder only happens to a certain demographic mm -hmm. or a certain area of town or, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, when you look at our Faces of Unsolved Homicide page, you will see every race, every gender, every age group, age group yeah. you know, from all walks of life, from every area of the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's a very powerful statement when you start scrolling through those images and recognizing that, that murder could happen to anyone, um, unfortunately, at any time. So um, that's what that submission will do first, mm -hmm. is it's gonna make its way onto that Faces of Unsolved Homicide page. Um, we do a weekly recap on social media um, and what that recap basically is is any cases that came in that week that we were able to had pictures and we were able to confirm uh, the information on they will be featured on that in that friday. on that friday mm -hmm. post um, and on facebook that usually happens at the end of the day mm -hmm. between 5 30 and 6 30 uh, eastern time um, and it just rotate, you know, it shows all the pictures that were submitted that week, all the victims that were or vetted that week. Sometimes it takes a week or more to get the, uh, the picture and to get mm -hmm. the, all the information we need. But once that happens, um, and Frida does a great job of, of typically calling in, emailing the families mm -hmm. and letting them know that their loved one is going to be in that uh, post. Uh, we encourage our families and others to share those posts because um, that's how we get the, the awareness part of it done. Um, we also do weekly remembrances, mm -hmm. um, typically on Sunday, we'll run a post that shows, uh, the victims that are, are, have an anniversary of their murder, you know, that week. Um, so those usually run on Sundays. Uh, they also run after our Facebook lives every week. We run them, mm -hmm. uh, as just another way to get those images out there and get those faces out there again let the families know that that's happening so that they can share that information. Um, you know, it's important that you, you know, that we have your contact information. Update it. Updated. Contact information because sometimes, you know, the, the phone number changes, but um, I've been very successful with using the email accounts. 
um, and then they'll call back in. But please, if your information changes, um, call back in. That way you can stay aware of what we're doing and how we're um, advocating for your loved one. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, we do a, a cold case of the day uh, in our Instagram story. Uh, and those are, you know, again, kind of the, the use the uh, anniversary of the murder as the date to feature them uh, uh, just another way on another platform, uh, trying to get their face out there, a little bit of their story out there. So hopefully somebody will see it and, you know, maybe come forward uh, with information. Um, we've, we do spotlights. If you follow our, our website, uh, and our, uh, social media pages, you'll see that typically on Monday morning, a new cold case spotlight will go live on our website, projectcoldcase.org. Uh, that, that spotlight, um, is kind of prominently featured on our homepage, uh, and it, and it kind of keeps the last three, um, uh, spotlights that we did. So, each of those uh, victims gets, you know, a week at one spot and gets to stay on the homepage for really three weeks. Uh, they're still on the website forever under cold case uh, spotlights or under case spotlights under that tab, but they rotate the newest ones on the homepage. Um, <clears throat> we share those on social media usually later in the day. We've kind of found that um, for us, we get the most engagement in our posts between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m. You know, during the week. So that's when you're gonna see most of our posts. Um, we've gotten a lot of reach and a lot of engagement uh, recently, which we can only thank you, know, you that are watching these and, and commenting and liking and sharing these um, <coughs> excuse me, posts. And that's true, I'll, I'll get a phone call probably once a week where someone is like, what do you do? Is this real? And I've seen it on someone's page. So we know that our families are indeed sharing it. Um, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's a big part of what we what we do and why we do it is, is u utilizing social media to its full potential. And that's mm -hmm. to reach as many people as possible. And we can only do that, you know, with uh, with our supporters uh, sharing, liking and commenting on our posts that just uh, ups the you know, the engagement, uh, which is what Facebook likes to keep it showing up on people's timelines. So, um, so keep doing that. We really do appreciate it. Um, uh, those spotlights uh, again are, they're written spotlights that are a little more in depth about, um, the victim and their story. We try to get quotes from their loved one. If law enforcement is available, we try to get some added information from them. Um, some of you have probably heard from us recently we partner with the university of north florida and a journalism class there and they do a uh, one of their class projects is is to interview families and do spotlights for our uh, website so um, whenever that opportunity uh, presents itself which is you know pretty much every mm -hmm. semester mm -hmm. um, we we start looking for another uh, group of cases um, to feature we also have a couple of people that do um, the do spotlights for us kind of on the side you know helping us out so you may hear from them um, but one thing you will always hear is from us first typically yes. Frida will call you ask I always you call and email um, before we do anything so the family's always aware of what we're doing and then of course to pass on their contact information if they are going to be the families in the spotlight so. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll never get a call from some UNF student and have no <laughs> idea what they're talking about. Um, these students are pretty much terrified to uh, to call these families. So we have to make sure that we have, you know, called the family, made sure the family is aware and mm -hmm. knows what's going on, and then, um, you know, <laughs> and pave the path for them so that uh so the emails not a, out there giving them some courage to yeah, go ahead and yeah do it. encourage them to do it uh their biggest fear of course is uh, would be cold calling mm -hmm. uh you know a, a murder victim's family which we understand which is exactly why we do do it the process that mm -hmm. we do um uh we're hopeful to be um to grow these spotlights into more of them than just one a week. Um, we have a lot of families that reach out to us wanting to know when mm -hmm. our loved one, when's my loved one going to be spotlighted. And, you know, we really didn't have any idea that so many people would submit cases and, 
you know, we've always thought, well, we'll just do them in the order we get them. And it never dawned on us that by only doing one a week, that's only 50 mm -hmm. a year. And that would put us about 12 years behind on just, just the number that we have exactly. uh, right now. You know, it would take us 12 years at, at one a week. So, um, you know, that's something to think about that we are trying and we're trying to get them out. Um, you know, all, all of them we want to get out. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's we also don't want to take away from a spotlight by doing multiple in a day or something like that. So we're we're working on ways to expand that and grow that. Uh, to do more a week, you know, maybe do two a week, three a week. We've, we've brainstormed some ideas about um, different ways we can kind of do a big push of them, like 50 states and, you know, 50 mm -hmm. days or something like that, where we do one cold case spotlight from every state one day after another. Or, uh, you know, what are some of the other 30 cases in 30 days? Mm -hmm. Spotlight week where we do, you know, uh, one a day for a week, maybe once a quarter we do that. And, and uh, you know, just ways to get the information out there. Uh, we are trying, if you're waiting on us to do a spotlight, just know that that's, that's been the process. Um, we've, we're just inundated with, with cold cases. And, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's sad because you don't want to saturate, you know, our website and put all this information out there on everyone's loved one, but then you still realize it still needs to happen. So it just kind of puts that, that visual that there are an abundance of unsolved cold cases out here. Absolutely. Um, we do, <coughs> you've seen these on our Facebook lives. We do uh, media stories here locally in Jacksonville. We have partnerships with uh, First Coast News. Uh, Katie Jeffries does a series called Unsolved. Um, we have a partnership with Action News Jax. Uh, Lorena Inclan does a series called Project Cold Case. Um, we're constantly working with them to get more cases out there in the public eye. Um, uh, you know, because they're local news stations, their, their criteria is to limit it to the viewing area. Um, we have goals and objectives to expand that to uh, when we do a spotlight on a case. We just did one. Uh, today on um, Ruth Hot down in uh, St. Cloud, Florida, is where her her body was was recovered. Um, we'd like to be able to reach out to that local media when we do a spotlight and, and encourage them to follow it up uh, with a with a spotlight. We encourage our families to reach out to the media as well and try to get them engaged and involved in, in raising this awareness. Um, you know, as as we expand, one of our goals will be to to have somebody that can reach out to to media in different areas and try to promote that mm -hmm. stuff um, and see if we can we can generate more uh, stories that way. Um, we it's not uncommon. It kind of comes in waves, but it's not uncommon for us to get contacted by production companies that are working on new shows for investigation discovery and what a, documentaries <laughs> and magazines and uh, whatever other national kind of media there is out there. And we've learned that that, that can be a double-edged sword. You know, we want our families to get all of the attention possible, but we've been burned uh, a few times by that, um, mm -hmm. by those same production companies. And, uh, and they just really, really, really don't care. You know, yeah, they're uh, seeking that entertainment value as yeah. opposed to handling the families with respect and delicacy. So. Exactly. And at the, at the end, once they get the, uh, the content, um, that's yeah. pretty much where they, they cut ties and, and, uh, they don't follow through with things that they say they will. And so we're extremely hesitant to, um, to, you know, jump on those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of people out there, a lot of survivors that want nothing more than for their loved one to be on a, a national television show and to get that kind of exposure. And, um, and I, I wish we felt more confident in those mm -hmm. companies. Um, you know, we've had a, a few good experiences, uh, but we've had a few really, really bad experiences that have kind of ruined it for everybody. We still take um, into account, you know, those uh, production companies, we'll talk to them, um, we'll kind of vet them, and then we'll decide if if it's something we want to be associated with or not. 
Um, if it is something we want to be associated with, they typically give us a list of their uh, criteria for whatever the the uh, the show is going to be about. Um, you know, these shows don't call about single victim homicides that are you know robberies. That's just too vanilla for them. They don't care about stuff like that. They always have to have some kind of sensational factor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, multiple victims, some kind of, you know, added, you know, sensationalization, gross factor, whatever it is. Um, they're always looking to kind of raise the bar and outdo the next one. So, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times they call. They ask me, you know, they've heard about my dad's story. They ask about it and, and they're like, yeah, that, that doesn't really fit what we're looking for. I'm like, of course not, <laughs> you know. Single victim murder of a robbery, how bland, you know. Yeah. Like, um, so that, that can be frustrating. Uh, we, we really feel like all our families and all of these victims deserve the same amount of exposure and publicity um, and awareness. And it can be frustrating when a production company calls up and says, well, you know, we're only looking for, you know, 10 year old girls that mm -hmm. were killed, you know, at school, you know, it just, um, it, it's hard, uh, to, to swallow that sometimes when you know, there's a lot of these cases that could be solved with mm -hmm. that, uh, awareness and publicity. And if exactly. they had that kind of attention, um, but, but their goal a lot of times is, is not to, uh, um, it's not necessarily to solve that case, but to get as many viewers mm -hmm. as possible. And we got burned. If you've, followed our Facebook lives and watched us. You, you remember Patty Lord sitting in here one day, uh, retired advocate and survivor whose daughter was featured on the killing fields and her telling, um, the story, you know, of what that was like to experience, um, them pitch this wonderful idea of how they were going to help solve Carrie's case and spend tons of money, uh, on the production of that show um, only to manipulate the timeline, sensationalize things, create things uh, that actually weren't, never happened and weren't true, but just to, to capture viewers and get people to tune in every week. And uh, it was, it was pretty devastating to the family. And we kind of, you know, made an oath then that we wouldn't be so quick to jump on mm -hmm. uh, a, a television show just because, you know, you think that, th that that's going to be the answer to all your problems, you know. Um, Facebook Lives like we're doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, you see us, we meet with Lorena and Katie and we review cases that have been on the news in the past. Um, again, our goal here is to get these cases out as much and as often as possible. So if they feature a case on the local news and it's not solved, then typically about a year later, we're gonna come back and we're gonna show it on our Facebook Live and we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about that case and try to update it. Um, so those are <coughs> other ways um, that we try to, to reach families mm -hmm. um, and, and raise awareness for cases. We also use the Facebook Live like today to kind of inform and educate our, our viewers on, on, you know, what our um, policies are, our procedures, uh, what, you know, perspective comes from law enforcement or prosecutors. Um, as you know, you've, you've seen a, a wide variety of people on our, uh, on our Facebook lives and, and our goal is always to just get as much information out there as mm -hmm. possible to help other families. Um, these banners that you see behind us, they're retractable, they fold up and they go with us when we have an event or when we have a speaking engagement or when we're at a community event. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the faces that have been submitted that are on that website, they're also uh, on those banners and, and travel with us when we, when we go somewhere. Um, you know, those are kind of in a nutshell, I think what what we do to raise awareness for cases mm -hmm. like when you when you send your loved one to us those are the things that we're going to do or we're going to try to do um, any opportunity that ever crosses our desk whether it's an email from a production company a phone call from a newspaper or magazine um, we will entertain that what they're looking for and we will try to um, 
to figure out a way to make it happen for the most efficient and effective way possible for our survivors. Um, you know, that's happened in the past with a couple of different things. We were able to uh, publish the book Grief Diaries Project Cold Case with uh, 22 stories of um, families from across the country. Uh, when that opportunity presented itself, we jumped on it and we shared those stories, one of which was solved. Um, and hopefully more of them will too. Uh, when we, you know, we had a lot of people ask about playing cards. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> that's typically something that the Crime Stoppers uh, or Crime Line will do. They'll print out the playing cards with a victim's face on there and a narrative, and they'll pass them out in the jails and hope that uh, while the inmates are playing cards that they may see a case that, that reminds them of something and uh, will come forward. Uh, we had an opportunity to do card playing cards, but it's a little more difficult for us because you know our grant allows us to serve cases in Florida, well, there's a lot of cases in Florida, so how do you decide mm -hmm. which 52 cases you're going to put on a deck of Florida playing cards? And that could even be said for the city of Jacksonville. How do you take 1,500 cases and narrow it down to 52 mm -hmm. that get to be on playing cards? Um, but we got a, we recently had an opportunity to make playing cards, not that will go in, in prisons, um, but that will uh, be handed out to a few hundred law enforcement officers um, and we really couldn't pass up the opportunity to share um, some of our families with law enforcement and um, and also kind of to remind law enforcement um, you know the importance of these cases uh, we added some uh, law enforcement cases some some police officers that were murdered whose cases are still unsolved and uh, you see here that's Carrie Singer, um, Patty's daughter from uh, from Isla, was killed in Isla White, Virginia. Um, she's one of the cards that we did. So uh, when that opportunity presents itself and it is um, appropriate, we will um, we will do things mm -hmm. like that. And that's always a goal of ours is to is to have as many families um, as we can. I remember when that uh, the Killing Fields reached out to me and wanted to wanted cases for the show they were very specific about their criteria they wanted victims that had been um, left out in the elements for uh, a, a matter of time it didn't really matter whether it was a few days or a few weeks or months but they wanted um, you know a case that was complicated due mm -hmm. to to those factors and at the time this was very early on in, in project cold cases existence and we only had, I think, I want to say five or six cases that matched that criteria. Um, and one of them didn't really match the criteria. It was a, a victim that was um, left in the, in the trunk of a car. And so the kind of the, the end result was the same of the decomposition. It just wasn't outside in the elements. Mm -hmm. and, um, but we sent all of those cases to them and said, you know, these are the five or six that we have that match your criteria. They came back and said, Carrie Singer case, we're interested in that one. Do you know the family? And so, you know, what we did was what we do. We go over to the families and say, you know, is this something you would be interested in? Um, if they say yes, then we proceed mm -hmm. to pass on that contact information. Um, and if they say no, then we, then we don't. But that was kind of how that, uh, that ball started rolling. And uh, I've told Patty a, a hundred times, I wish we had never uh, accepted that. But, um, you know, but she's, she also uh, is a very strong woman and understands that there was actually some good that came of it. There mm -hmm. was a lot of testing that was done uh, on Carrie's case that, um, that wouldn't have been done without the kind of budget that a, a Discovery Channel show creates. So, um other services we provide, Frida, we do support meetings uh, monthly. Yep, grief support meetings, um, which are going well. We're definitely keeping it consistent. Um, so definitely that's something that we're trying to ensure that our families here locally know they have. Um, because oftentimes, as I said before, um, it's kind of hit or miss out there. Um, another service that I do um, for our victims is, you know, depending on location, if they don't, you know, have that resource to look out, 
and see what's in their area, I'll do that for them and then email them the national and local resources that I find. Um, but again, that's hit or miss. Um, yeah. So. But we do try to we, we encourage um, survivors to attend support meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not all sad and, uh, and awkward and weird. Like I think, you know, <laughs> it's such kind of in our mind. That's what we envision when we think mm-hmm. of those things. Uh, last month we had some therapy dogs yeah. uh, join us, and um, and that was a that was a really cool and um, new mm-hmm. twist on a, on a grief support meeting. Um, we do these usually. Uh, it's just peer led. It's just us um, and our experiences, sharing our experiences. Uh, mm-hmm. We do have uh, some facilitated support groups, a couple a year that we are going to start doing. Um, uh, we do have some contacts to some other areas where support groups are provided, and, uh, and Frida is always quick to, to look look for others. Um, so if that's something you're interested in and you need a hand with, you know, feel free to call our office. Uh, you know, we have kind of taking on this new role. So archiving was mm-hmm. something that was kind <laughs> of a um, happy coincidence to yeah. something we a service we never intended to provide that we started providing and beyond just scanning photos mm-hmm. for a family um, we were getting cases from the 70s and 80s and even some of the 90s that uh, didn't show up on the internet you know exactly. you, you could you'd google a name and nothing would come up so when we started taking on these cases um, now they would start showing up uh, on Google searches, either on our website or our spotlight or our social media accounts or the news station that, that we would um, have do a story on the case. And, uh, and it really, you know, it was kind of uh, impactful for mm-hmm. us to realize that, that we were creating these stories mm-hmm. um, for the world that, ha- that were real stories that had been told but had not been told in the internet era you know and so they were not uh, i think about the the george schwinder case and uh, harry shank they you know two brinks truck drivers that were uh, shot at and um, george schwinder was killed and harry shank was injured and ended up dying years later as a result of those injuries uh but it was a you know armored truck robbery you Mm -hmm. know and uh and that when we met with the family, they had newspaper clippings for days because mm-hmm. it was a very big deal. Uh, Brinks had put up, you know, you think about 1970, is that 71? Um, a $25,000 reward back then. I mean, that that case got a lot of publicity. Um, it was in a lot of newspapers. And if you typed it in Google before mm-hmm. we, we got involved, none of it would show up. <laughs> Not one of those stories would show up so um you know that was something that was really cool to us that started a brainstorming uh session that was how cool would it be if we could provide some archiving um, for families Mm -hmm. and we could take their pictures and digitize them and take old vhs tapes and digitize Mm -hmm. them um so we're we're looking into getting into that we're we're starting that process now and seeing what it's going to take uh, but it'll be another service that we can offer families that, you know, um, we had a case recently where the family said uh, there was a house fire not long after the murder and they mm-hmm. lost all of their photos, you know, so they have like one photo of their loved one. And, you know, we just the way people move around now and do things like we don't want uh, mm-hmm. we don't want anybody to lose out on those photos. So if we can archive them for you you know and, and I think scan them. also with the some of our older families you know um where the homicide occurred decades ago they probably haven't pulled out those vhs's or looked at some of that stuff and you know technology's changed so much yeah you know so now if we can help them archive that and get it to them so they can see it on a daily yeah basis that'd be awesome it's really cool i mean it's it's a it's one of those services that you don't think about mm-hmm. until you know you realize that you know, your album with your loved one's pictures are up in the attic mm-hmm. getting, you know, chewed on by squirrels. And some of the pictures, <laughs> you know, some of those pictures we, we get sent in, they're so old and just worn. And they're like, this is the only one I have. And yeah. it's just like, 
We need or, to start helping these families preserve yeah. those memories. Or, or a family, you know, the only thing they can do is take the frame photo and yeah. then take a picture of it with their phone mm-hmm. and it's got, you know, a big glare on it. And, you know, and it just, uh, you know, but a, a lot of our victims, you know, there were before the uh, the cell phone was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a camera in everybody's hand at every moment. And, uh, you know, pictures had to be <laughs> developed and then put in albums and, you know what I mean? And so um, sometimes that's all they have. They don't have them in digital format and we want to help so that they can, uh, they can, you know, obviously we can put it on our website, but then they can email it if, if family members want it, if the media calls and wants a picture, mm-hmm. uh, they have easy access to it. Um, you know, we do a lot of uh, kind of consulting. It's kind of a weird thing, but um, whether it's with law enforcement mm-hmm. on how to handle certain situations or advocates and how to handle it, uh, but setting up meetings with mm-hmm. law enforcement or, um, or even like, the proper way to set up a uh, a Facebook or social media memorial page uh, for someone's loved one. I mean, it's a, a big thing right now to have a justice for mm-hmm. so-and-so uh, Facebook page, uh, but there are, are, are appropriate ways to do that and effective ways to do that, and then there are ways that, that um, not only don't work as well, but maybe violating Facebook uh, rules and then they can shut your page mm-hmm. down and you can lose everything that's on there. So um, we've done a, a Facebook Live on that. Uh, we've sat down with families in our conference room and reviewed uh, how to best do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we've sent that out as well via email, yeah, sent, uh, best practices. Yeah, and sent that out. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, these are, like I said, a lot of the things that we do <laughs> and ways that, that we're trying to help. Um, Frida, you make phone calls on anniversaries. I do. Uh, I, um, on or I around, mm-hmm. depending on when what's going on and when they are. Um, you know, I think I forgot about our database. Totally, we have twenty three thousand unsolved yeah. murders in our database, uh, which is these, you know, all of these cases behind us plus ones that we have done um, uh, public records requests for. Uh, in different jurisdictions and agencies and different mm-hmm. cities, states, and what have you. So uh, when you when you submit a case, your mm-hmm. case gets added to the database as well. Uh, that database was created um, not so much for our survivors to be able to look at, but um, you know our goal was if somebody actually had information on a case and they didn't know the victim's name, mm-hmm. they just happened to be a witness, um, yeah, you know, I, I often use an example of, you know, people leaving a club at night and somebody opens fire and somebody gets killed and you didn't know the shooter or the mm-hmm. victim. Uh, and at the time you just wanted to get out of that parking lot safely. Uh, but maybe you saw mm-hmm. the car, the license plate, a description of the suspect and, you know, law enforcement may know who that person is. They may just be waiting on somebody that can confirm it was the driver of a red truck or, or whatever that is. And we wanted that person to be able to go to the database and say, search for, you know, I don't remember the, I don't know the name. I don't remember the date. I just know it was in this city. I know it was on this street. I know it was between, you know, this, mm-hmm. between these months. Uh, we felt like it was important for somebody with that little amount of information to have a place where they could go and, uh, and find out if that case had ever been solved and if it hadn't been solved, who they could contact um, mm-hmm. to solve it so, or, or give their information. Uh, we also did that for media, um, you know, to be able to, to look up cases and do research. Um, uh, but ultimately, it was really for people that may have information and, and now be willing to come forward. Uh, we also know if you follow our Facebook page, you saw the, the post from last week that was about the uh, Texas Ranger, uh, Ranger Holland, who interviewed uh, Samuel Little. You may have seen it on 60 Minutes uh, Sunday as well. Uh, one of the most prolific mm-hmm. serial killers in our history. He's killed over 90 women uh, on just about every every state you know he traveled from coast to coast um and he did it under the radar they were never searching for a serial killer uh but um he got busted in california with uh, some dna evidence and he'd been doing this from like the 1970s until 
you know, just a few years well, until the nineties, I think. And then, um, he got, he got busted maybe the two thousands, but there was a, a, a cold case conference in St. Pete, Florida, one that project cold case attended and presented at, uh, Ranger Holland was there and presented, uh, interrogation techniques, interview techniques. And, uh, and somebody, I still haven't figured out who it was. Somebody in that audience went up to Ranger Holland and said, there's a guy in California that's killed two women and I think he's killed, you know, somebody in Florida and I think he might be a serial killer. Do you, you know, can we use your techniques on him? And they, they figured out a way to, uh, to get Ranger Holland, you know, to interview him. And next thing you know, um, Samuel Little connected with Ranger Holland and just started spilling it uh, <laughs> on all these murders. And I think they've, confirmed over 60 of them or almost 60 mm. of them and uh, uh samuel little had like a photographic memory so he could remember names he could remember locations but he was getting older so sometimes they'd get kind of mingled and confused um, but a lot, he's now sketched out images of his victims and the fbi has released those images in an attempt to to get those uh, those victims ID'd. So, uh, have we forgotten? I'm, I know, I'm you sure know we, we have. Yeah, there's forgotten. plenty we, we've forgotten, but, you know. Well, I think Does maybe, start? yeah, maybe we'll come back with a part two when we list out all the things we forgot to mention yeah. today. But, um, but that's a little glimpse into, you know, the services we can provide, uh, you know, you, you didn't hear investigation in there at all because that's not one of them. We do not no. investigate these cases. Um, because we're not investigators, we also can't take on cases that are suspicious um, in nature or suicides that are, um, that are suspicious. Uh, not because we don't believe these families, mm -hmm. not because we, we don't want you to have uh, justice if that's the case. It's just that's not our role you know so um but we will help wherever we can with whatever we can and we will constantly um look for ways to mm -hmm. to raise awareness for your loved one's case and um and we'll continue to do that uh, as long as we can so um feel free to to check out our website and submit that case projectcoldcase.org under the contact tab uh check out our faces of unsolved homicide on our website Check out the case spotlights on, on our website. Follow us on social media. Uh, Facebook is, you know, Project Cold Case. Um, Twitter is at Project Cold Case. Uh, and uh, Instagram is at Project underscore cold underscore case. And um, if you need to reach us, you can call our office, area code 904 525 8080. And Frida will help you out. Sure will. Or I will, however we can. So thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, you know, leave them uh, in the post, and we'll try to answer those as well. And uh, we'll check back in with you next week. Thanks a lot.